lighting. Can everybody see the giant projection of H.P. Lovecraft? Yes. <laughs> and if you can't, can you see it over there? Yes. Okay. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the second American Literature Lecture Series um, featuring Jennifer Bird and Seth Cardin. Um, if you guys are in your, what, say, final week and a half of studies, we really appreciate you coming out and supporting us. I know you're tired. We are too, your faculty. Um, but I also wanted to just kind of give you guys a side note. It's students like these that make this job awesome. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Jennifer Bird, who will be covering H.P. Lovecraft, and then she'll be followed by Seth Cardin, who's going to cover Stephen King. Please welcome. Hope everyone's doing okay today. Can everybody in the back hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about H.P. Lovecraft. How many here have ever heard of H.P. Lovecraft? Awesome. I am in good company then. Um, Lovecraft lived predominantly in the 1920s, when he did most of, which is when he did most of his writing. But um, he's credited as being a huge inspiration for a lot of our horror writers today. And in the course of doing my research, I found out that there's not as large of a body on horror literature as there is on horror film. Which is interesting because Lovecraft inspired tons of horror film. Um, in fact, some of the Roger Corman films from the 1960s, which were named after Edgar Allan Poe movies, or book stories, were actually based on stories by Lovecraft. Um, which also becomes interesting when you know that Lovecraft's biggest man crush in the universe was on Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, which tied in very nicely with my, my last semester's research for those of you who came to that lecture. Um, Stephen King, I think we can all recognized as a pretty huge name in horror literature today. And he said that Lovecraft opened the way for me, as he had done for the others before me. It is his shadow so long and gaunt, and his eyes so dark and puritanical, which over the over which overlie almost all the important horror fiction that has come since. These are pretty big words for, you know, the 350 million pages, uh, best selling novels that he sold all over the world. I um, wanted to kind of start and, and talk about his influence before I get into the rest of the meat of my, my presentation. These are covers from some pretty recent anthologies that are not Lovecraft's work. I think one of them is, and that is Tales of the Lovecraft Craft Mythos, edited by Robert Price. Those are Lovecraft stories, but the rest of these are all stories inspired by Lovecraft. <coughs> written by readers of the modern day. Um, just a few of those writers, you probably have heard some of them, most of them, maybe not, but you should look into them. Uh, Robert Block, the author of Psycho, which was adapted into film, was a contemporary, um, sort of, very young when he corresponded with Lovecraft. Um, Robert E. Howard, the author of the Conan series um, of the 1930s, was a correspondent with Lovecraft. Um, they were pretty close friends. Uh, Fritz Lieber, if you've not heard of him, he wrote the, the, the Noan stories with uh, Fawford and the Grey Mouser, a very popular sword, sword and sorcery fantasy. Um, Brian Lumley, Roger Zelazny, who wrote the Amber Chronicles. I feel like I'm being obscure here, but, uh, but bear with me. Uh, Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman wrote um, a Holmes, Sherlock Holmes, H.P. Lovecraft pastiche called A Study in the Emerald. Um, it was a very interesting crossover, but he's highly influenced in his horror with, with Lovecraft and some of the topics I'm going to talk about a little later with the cosmic horror and the fear of the unknown. Um, Stephen King, of course. Uh, Michael Carbon was one of the ones that, and I think I said his name right, he was one of the ones that surprised me in the list because he's considered a fairly literary writer, and he shows up on a lot of uh, national um, award lists that are not genre-based. Uh, he got quite a few awards for The Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, uh, the, Yiddish, the Yiddish Policeman's Unit, I think it's called. Yes, and um, Joyce Carol Oates, another big name that you might run into in your literature classes. These people were all, can all trace back their influences to 
uh, Love Tracks works. Then we have a little bit more pop culture. Um, recently they did a remake of The Evil Dead. While the original Evil Dead series ended with Army of Darkness, which features, you can hardly see up there, but the Necronomicon. Um, you have Batman, which the doom that came to Gotham is named directly after one of Lovecraft's stories. Also, DC Universe took Arkham Asylum, the name for Arkham Asylum, from the fictional town of Arkham, which Lovecraft created in his tales. Uh, Hellboy also deeply influenced and includes a giant tentacle monster, which are some of Lovecraft's favorite things. Um, there were games created in 1980, the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game for tabletop was designed. Um, that's a, there's a whole line of board games, uh, card games. There are several festivals that happen, in, in, you know, based solely on Lovecraft's work. One of my favorite things is that the, the fandom of Lovecraft expanded into everything. Um, during elections, you will find these things as bumper stickers, t-shirts, logos, everywhere. And the whole idea is, why vote, why vote for the lesser evil, you know? If you're gonna go, go all out. <laughs> Um, and then there's the ways that it's integrated into popular culture that aren't, it's not necessarily literary. Um, in the center, of course, it's Poe and Lovecraft <coughs> fighting evil in a, in a graphic novel. Um, we have the adaptation for Charles Schultz, Charlie Brown, Hello Cthulhu, <laughs> um, Derby Cthulhu, which is absolutely adorable, and somebody adapted his Call of Cthulhu story into the Dr. Seuss style of art. Um, a friend sent me this from the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival. <coughs> Do you remember the book where the wild things are? <laughs> this is where the deep ones are, which is pretty direct. Um, I know you won't be able to see it very well, but it's it's got the monsters and the little kid, and it's it's pretty close to the original story, except the monsters. Um, so it's it's pretty obvious that Lovecraft is. It's fully integrated into our culture, whether we're absolutely aware of him or not. And this is the nature of the language of Lovecraft stories, they're hard to say. This is a real search site. You can go there and search terms and it will return you to sites that are based on the Lovecraft stories. <coughs> so, getting into the real stuff now, I guess. Uh, Lovecraft was born in 1890 in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, his father was a traveling salesman, salesman who uh, was hardly ever home. His mother came from a very wealthy fam uh, New England family. Um, his father, when he was three years old, had a psychotic break in Chicago, was brought back to Rhode Island, uh, institutionalized. <coughs> it's pretty much well known that he died of syphilitic complications, though Lovecraft would deny that his entire life. Whether he actually knew the truth or not is up for debate. Um, but he died in uh, Butler Hospital uh, when Lovecraft was eight years old. After his father died, he moved in, his mother moved in with his grandfather and his two aunts. And his grandfather was his favorite person in the world. His grandfather took him in and he got him to reading. Uh, he was a very nervous boy. He was not in school very often. When he was eight years old, he was taken out for an extended absence um, due to nervous ills. In fact, that's why he never graduated high school. Uh, during his senior year, he had, a, he had a nervous breakdown and never returned. Uh, but his grandfather got him into reading, and Grandma Poe was on the high on the list, along with a lot of the other uh, Gothic authors that were kind of post-contemporaries and predated him just a bit. Um, but his grandfather died in 1904. Lovecraft was 14 years old. Um, his mother, actually lived quite quite a while into his life, but in 1919, suffering from hysteria, she also had a nervous breakdown and was committed and died just a few years later. This crushed Lovecraft. Um, his mother was kind of his world after that point. He ended up living with his aunts. He lived mostly in poverty because when his grandfather died, the estate was mishandled. Um, they lost all their money. They ended up living in this tiny little apartment in, in uh, Providence. So he's, he still, throughout his life, acts as though he's this um, privileged, upper-class gentleman. 
but he has no money. A lot of his friendships kind of operated on the basis that his friends allowed him to continue this, this facade of having money, but they tried not to put him out too much when they'd go out to like lunch because he insisted on paying it. He insisted on, on playing the part of what he thought his life should have been. Um, he died on the Ides of March. I don't know if that's really funny, but it, it kind of strikes me as a little ironic <coughs> from cancer of the small intestine, which he pretty much hid from all of his uh, friends via correspondence for the last months of his life. <coughs> So to give you an idea about what was going on in America during Lovecraft's time, because when we start talking about his, his works here shortly, there's a lot of his works that they simply don't deal with the world that he actually lived in. Um, they, they kind of deal with more internal fears and aspects. So, you know, he was 13 when the Wright brothers flew their first flight in Kitty Hawk. Um, he was 18 when the automobile entered mass production. Uh, Haley's Comet happened. The first infrared photographs, and I was going to bring some pictures, but they look really weird. You should Google them in tandem if you ever look up Lovecraft. They're, they're very interesting to, to see what it looks like. Um, the Piltdown Man skull was discovered. Evolution was a huge deal during uh, Lovecraft's time, uh, you know, lifetime. And the Piltdown Man was a hoax that was perpetrated by some people in England that said, we have the first modern human skull. All of these other skulls that you say lead to us are, are wrong because this thing is so old. This is us. Our brain was definitely huge before our jaws adapted. He, and, you know, and that didn't get disproven until after Lovecraft's death. Um, World War I began in 1914. Uh, he's 24 years old. Proxima Centauri, which is the nearest star to our star, 4.24 light, light years away was discovered and Pluto was photographed for the first time. It wasn't a planet yet, it isn't a planet now, but <laughs> <laughs> he actually writes about it, he calls it Yugoth. He refers to Pluto in some of his stories. General relativity, uh, we entered World War I and Lovecraft never served in World War I. He reported for duty and he had these, he wrote these letters about this glorious vision of him as this this Teutonic crusader, you know, going forth on the field of battle, and he was deemed unfit for service. <coughs> which disappointed him greatly. We had the prohibition was passed, which I don't think bothered him at all. I don't think he drank. Uh, uh, Tennessee versus Scopes, the teacher who was arrested and fined for teaching evolution in his classroom. Um, we had the Harlem Renaissance happening in New York, and he lived there for a brief time and did not enjoy it. Um, flappers were really the, the biggest significant, signifi uh, they were very significant in trying to paint a picture of how life was changing in America at the time. Uh, for me, flappers were like this iconic figure that kind of showed how far we had moved away from the sensibilities of Victorian, the Victorian 1800s. Um, and there was a lot of immigration going both from outside of the country and inside of our country at the time. Um, you know, it's, he started out writing poetry as a young man. In fact, he didn't start writing his fiction until later, but he also wrote scientific articles. Uh, he loved chemistry and astronomy. Those were his two major focuses. And he, um, he actually got noticed by a journalism group because he wrote a letter into one of the literary magazines criticizing them for printing a set of stories by Fred Jackson that he thought spent too much time on the romance of the stories and didn't get to the point. Um, and they had a back and forth banter, similar to the way that, that Poe had his criticisms back and forth with Longfellow. Um, he, as a man of letters, they say that he wrote 70,000 letters in his lifetime, making him second only to Voltaire as far as a body of, of personal correspondence. We can find about 20,000 of those. And people have said that the estimation can't be right because he didn't live long enough to have written that many letters. So there's a little dispute there, but you can find books of his letters between him and other authors, and they are extensive. Um, he was only published in pulp magazines during his life, uh, predominantly weird tales and amazing stories, which have kind of gone in and out of um, publication over the years. I think at least one of them is still publishing today, but it's kind of as a revival. Um, this was an interesting thing I came across in my studies and I wanted to bring up. 
if Lovecraft had gone to war, Lovecraft would have been considered one of our lost generation authors. Um, these include people like Hemingway, uh, Steinbeck, Fitzgerald, Elliot, Miller. These are, this is the generation that, that saw World War I, and it's not that they were lost, it's what they lost. Um, there was a sense of idealism in America before that, and they went into war, and then they came back, and they knew that we won, but what did we lose in the process? Not all good men came back from World War I. And this is a theme that comes up in a lot of their writing, and I feel that, I feel that Lovecraft reflects some of these things, despite having not gone. Um, you know, there's moral aimlessness, there's disillusionment, the isolation and alienation, which we'll talk about, and the fact that good doesn't always win. The story I, I went over for my project here, the good guys actually win at the end, which is a very odd thing for a Lovecraft story. Typically, at the end of the story, the good guys do good, but they don't live. They, they die. You know, there's sometimes there's just things you don't go back from. And that's kind of the theme that Lovecraft carries through his stuff. Um, was too much recognition because he was not regarded well during his life. He never published a, a solid book in his life. Um, Edmund Wilson was a pretty, uh, pretty hefty critic in the early 20th century, and he basically called him a hack. He was like, Lovecraft is terrible. Um, but from 1999 to 2004, S.T. Joshi, who is a major scholar in Lovecraft studies now, um, published tons of collections, annotations, tons of scholarly work on it. In 2005, the Library of America finally published Lovecraft's stories in a collection. And to most people, this signified a moment when someone actually recognized that Lovecraft is part of America's canon. He is one of our authors and one of the authors that should be studied. Uh, it was kind of a validation many years after his death, but it's a validation nonetheless. Um, this quote's from the editor of the LOA when they asked him, why Lovecraft? He says, Lovecraft was a genuine and original, with a rigorous sense of narrative form at the service of a coherent vision of the universe. A vision that happens to embody the most extreme paranoia and unblinking pessimism. He will, I think, figure as an unavoidable mythologist in the 20th century. 2008, Barnes and Noble said, yeah, you know what, you're right, and added them to their essential collection. And then in 2011, released one of their very fancy, um, silver gilded, fine print books, which collects things that he wrote when he was seven and eight years old. So the Dunwich War, which is the story I focused on for my project, trying to get to it here, um, was written in 1928 and published in 1929, Weird Tales. Um, in brief, it's a story about an old man named Watley who plans to open a portal to another dimension uh, and invite back to Earth a creature called the Og Sothoth, who is an entity that exists outside of our universe. His daughter, impregnated by Yog Sothoth's power, gives birth to Wilbur and something else. When old Watley dies, Wilbur pursues the gold. He dies when trying to steal a copy of the Necronomicon, and an invisible beast is unleashed on the little village of Dunwich. A group of three professors from Miskatonic University, which is another of his creations, <coughs> um, who figure out what is going on, come to Dunwich and destroy the floor. It's a very simple story, but when you read it, he builds such a mood that it's, it's eerie. I would have lucky to find that on, online, so that author's online. Check him out. So, in the ways that, that Lovecraft adapted Gothic to his needs as a writer, and granted, he kind of wanted to live in the 18, 1800s, he really did, um, and he felt that his works were still re relevant to his time frame, and they're relevant to us. Um, the Gothic has not, it may have gone out of style, but the themes that are covered in Gothic literature haven't gone away. We still struggle with the ideas of isolation. We still struggle with the ideas of of you know, the sins of the father, of moral decay and corruption in society within ourselves. We still struggle for knowing what is forbidden knowledge and what is progress. Uh, and of course, cosmic horror, which is what exactly is out there? So with isolation in the Dunwich Horror, he, he, he sets up the entire first chapter is describing the journey to the village. The village is in the middle of nowhere, somehow, in Massachusetts. You travel far away from near civilization. And once you get to this small village in the middle of nowhere, it's like it's from some earlier time. The buildings are rotten. The roofs are old. Um, and then once you're in the town, you go, 
from four miles outside of town to this little farm to find this family that no one likes. Um, you know, and, and it takes the reader away from these comfort zones. It takes them away from, you know, habit, you know, habitated society. Um, for us as, as modern readers, isolation is a much more psychological and much, much less physical thing like it was in the time of Gothic writers. Um, not Lovecraft. Lovecraft lived in Providence, which was, was a city, let's face it. Um, but the isolation idea of distance is not as important or relevant to us because we're so packed together. But I found a study that said the extent of social isolation has hardly changed since 1985. And this study was supposed to show that social media is a good thing and it's advanced us and brought us closer together. But when you think about it, 1985, there was no internet. That was like 10 years later. Um, no Facebook. There were none of these ways that we connect with each other now. So as we've increased the ability to communicate with each other, we haven't actually changed our personal sense of social isolation. We still only have two to three close people who, with whom we discuss very deep topics. And that, that seemed odd to me that they would say this in such a positive way because it's not that positive. We haven't really gotten any closer despite all these ways that we are constantly in contact with other people. And I think that, that Lovecraft speaks to that with his family on that isolated farm. And you know, they're constantly interacting with the, the community, but they're not part of that community. And I, I feel like we, as modern readers, have that today. You know, in, in a college classroom, you can go to a class with somebody for 16 weeks and not know their name. Uh, moral decay and corruption. You have Watley who desires power and, and knowledge. Um, he uses his family as a means to an end. He gets his daughter impregnated by this other worldly being so that he can birth this creature that will help open this portal and grant him ultimate power over the universe. And who doesn't want that, right? <laughs> and his community accepts him. There's, there's mentions in Lovecraft's story about how they're like, they weren't sure about his old money. He has old gold coins he uses to pay for things. And they're not sure, but they'll take his money, because it's money. And for us, this is actually from my paper, um, for the contemporary reader, these things can be seen as part of the societal status quo of the new millennium. Powerful, long-lived industries, left to their own devices, becoming ever more corrupt, <coughs> and has remained unexamined until the consequences of this apathy unfold and impact the rest of, our, of the population. Just like the community in the story, they didn't care what he was doing in his farm, the crazy weirdo, until something happened that affected them. Um, tying this in with our class, you know, we, we see the, there's a lot of things happening in society that we don't pay attention to until it comes home. And there's, there's a warning to be had there. You know, there's a warning to be had that you should be aware of your world, of what's going on in it, not just reactionary to it. We have forbidden knowledge. Um, in Lovecraft stories, this is typically knowledge of other dimensions, other monsters, other places in the universe, things that man was not meant to know. Um, you know, we, we pursue forbidden knowledge to overcome our shortcomings, to overcome our mortality. We want to gain power, and we want to, we want to transcend from being just another person to being great. This can come through forbidden knowledge. This can come through lots of lots of means of gathering power, but Lovecraft deals specifically knowledge. And at the time he was living, we were discovering a great deal about the universe. Um, if you've ever watched any of the more recent stuff from um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, any of, any of those things where we talk about what the universe is made of and how much of the universe we've explored, if you let us sink in for a little while, it gets a little bit creepy how much is out there that we don't know about and we take for granted that we do. Um, <clears throat> Robert Price is one of the editors of, of several compilations of Lovecraft's work. He says, one seeks forbidden knowledge, whether wittingly or more likely unwittingly, but one may not know it until it is too late. The knowledge once gained is too great for the mind of man. It is Promethean, Faustian, <coughs> Faustian knowledge. Knowledge that destroys in the moment of enlightenment, a gnosis of damnation, not of salvation. And it's kind of a dim view Especially in, the, in a room full of people who are here to be educated to say, yeah, knowledge is great and all, but be careful going too far with it. 
Um, and it's not really the expansion of self and that sort of knowledge that, that Lovecraft speaks to, but I think he also speaks to the reckless usage of that knowledge. Um, in the beginning of Lovecraft's The Call of Cthulhu, the most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all of its contents. And that was the idea that if you knew everything you knew and you related them to each other, you would discover some very disturbing things. I think that holds true in a lot of ways. Um, but you also discover great things. So when they talk about interdisciplinary stuff, you, you should pay attention to this. Um, so at the end of this, he introduces the idea of cosmic horror. Cosmicism for Lovecraft is kind of pessimistic, kind of nihilistic, but he denies that those are what it should be called. It's contrary to what you may assume, I am not a pessimist, but an indifferent, <laughs> indifferentist. That is, I don't make the mistake of thinking that the cosmos give a damn, one way or the other, about the especial wants or ultimate welfare, mostly he means of man, or other forms of biological energy. He's saying that, you know, our star may go to supernova. It doesn't care about us. His message was that humanity is this blip on the radar, this small, tiny thing that doesn't matter in the grand scheme of the universe, and, and that's kind of an unsettling notion when you think of the <coughs> significance of mankind as a whole, especially when you're learning what great things we've accomplished in our own sphere. Um, I think that this is, this is relevant to our, our fears today. We worry that we're not good enough, that we're not smart enough, that we don't make a difference. And Lovecraft kind of said, you're right, you don't. And that's what makes this stuff terrifying, is nobody wants to think that once we're gone, that's it. Nobody cares. No, there, there's nothing that's going to care. Um, and we kind of live our lives trying to defy that notion. And I feel that even if Lovecraft believed this of the world, I feel that his message to us really is what we take out of it. What we can take away from his work is that, yeah, the universe is a cold and uncaring machine. It does not give one whit whether this, this ball that we're spinning on has oxygen or water. It's going to keep spinning, and the rest of it's going to keep spinning. But it matters what you do with it. You know, because we're here, we care. The universe doesn't have to. Um, and this is Lovecraft explains his his view a little bit more. All my tales are based on the fundamental premise <coughs> that common human laws and emotions have no validity or significance to the cosmos at large. Isn't that kind of scary? Can you imagine living your life writing stories based on this premise? Um, and then Stephen King, Lovecraft's works make us feel the size of the universe we hang suspended in, and suggest shadowy forces that can destroy us all, yet they so much as grunted in their sleep. So, to round out everything, um, I tried to give you guys a lot of information on Lovecraft, as small little balls I kept could. Um, horror is an important genre. Lovecraft, King, Poe, Dan Simmons, across the board, these are important themes that they show us. They allow us to externalize our feelings to ways we can talk about them. There's not a lot of people who are going to sit down for coffee and go, you know, I'm feeling kind of insignificant in the universe today. <laughs> you know, so horror allows us to, to take those in, or, or to worry about when we feel like, am I a bad person for thinking or doing this? Horror allows the externalization and the discussion to happen based on metaphors and allegories. Um, it makes it easier to come at an issue. You kind of when you come at it with horror and fiction, you kind of sidestep into it. And, and it's a little more casual. It's, it's not as aggressive, it's not as frightening to come at when you come at it through fiction. Um, the author Chuck Wendy really said it wonderfully. I tried to come up with a better way to say it, but he nailed it. From Beowulf <coughs> to Nathaniel Hawthorne, from Greek myth to Horace Walpole, horror's been around for a long, long time. Everything's all crushed bodies and extracted tongues and doom and devils and demigods. This is our literary legacy. The flower bed of our fiction is seeded with these kernels of horror and watered with gallons of blood and a sprinkling of tears. Horror is part of our narrative makeup. So with that, I'm actually going to hand it over to our current reigning king of horror and his presenter.
awesome. Well, thank you guys for coming here today. Uh, my name is Seth Carden, and I'm going to be presenting on Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. <coughs> um, I've been a fan of Stephen King for a very long time. I think the first story I ever read by him was a, was a short story called Survivor Type when I was about 10 years old, which is a story about a guy who gets uh, shipwrecked on a tiny little island, runs out of food, water, doesn't have any shelter, and ends up eating himself from, from the toes up. Uh, so, so for a 10 year old, that was you know, a pretty impressionable story. And uh, you know, it's, it's been downhill ever since. Um, I read Pet Cemetery for the first time when I was probably 13 years old. Uh, it's a story that has always stuck with me. It is very horrific. Um, and then when I read it again for this, it was horrific, but for completely different reasons. Now that I'm an adult and I've learned more about life, it is much more cerebral of a horror. Um, so where's all my Stephen King fans in the house? Can I get some hands? Yes. Awesome. Um, and is everybody here familiar with the story of Pet Cemetery? If you haven't read the book, if you've seen the movie, if you haven't seen the movie, you know about it, right? Okay. Um, so what I wanted to do, though, was I wanted to see if I could take a look at Pet Cemetery through, through a literary lens. And I use the term literary, literary with quotes uh, for a reason, and I'll get to that. Um, because I think that Stephen King tells us stories that address uh, very important issues and ideas about the human condition. Uh, that is to say, yes, he is an entertaining read, but at the same time, I think that many of his stories resonate with us after, after we're done reading uh, the story itself. Uh, I also want to do, kind of as an extension of uh, taking a look at Stephen King, was to validate horror as a genre. Um, that's, that's worthy of study. Um, I think that the horror addresses uh, our, our deepest fears. I think that horror asks, uh, at least good horror, asks us um, some pretty disturbing questions. And, and sometimes we come up with pretty disturbing answers about that as far as how we look at ourselves, how we relate to society and each other. So, let's take a look at Stephen King real quick, by the number. There he is, just rolling in the dough, because he is famous and makes a bunch of money. Um, <coughs> so yeah, as Jen said earlier, over 350 million books sold, and that's a pretty conservative, conservative estimate, especially when we take into consideration the global market. Um, we could probably say that, that easily it's doubled that. Um, so over 50 novels published, uh, close to 200 short stories and novellas. Uh, he's written some nonfiction pieces. And he has been the recipient of, of a bunch of writing awards. So he is, you know, without a doubt, he has massive popular appeal. He's, he's a pop culture icon, right? I mean, he's, he's transcended just that, that lowly authorly title, right? And he's just pervasive, he's everywhere. But when we, when we think about him and, and extrapolate that into a, a literary question, uh, you know, what, what is the answer there? What, you know, what about the literary community and what do they say about him? So I've, I've chosen to actually pick on one guy in particular. And his name is Harold Bloom. Some of you guys have probably heard of him. I <laughs> see Michael Level certainly has. Um, Harold Bloom is a Sterling professor at Yale University. <coughs> he is a, uh, a humanities professor. And I mean, he's, he's quite old now, in his 80s, I believe. He's been publishing uh, literary criticism books since 1959. Uh, he's uh, anthologized uh, several hundred different publications and, and edited um, all, all, all kinds of publications. But the thing with Harold Bloom, I mean, I have respect for him, but I don't like the guy. Um, he, he thinks that Western literature has been in a, in a very sharp decline since well, Billy Shakespeare died. Um, and there's very few authors alive right now uh, that, that he would even consider. Um, I wanted to, uh, now see the thing is, I'm okay with him putting on his judgy pants, but he, he very openly attacks people, including people like us who enjoy mixing up our entertaining reads with those that are considered more literary. So I wanted to say that he considers himself, and this is a quote, who instinctually reaches out for quality in literature and disdains the lemmings who devour J.K. Rowling and Stephen King as they race down the cliff to intellectual suicide in the gray ocean of the internet. <laughs> All right? And then, as, as 
far as King is concerned, uh, when King won the uh, National Book Award, uh, it's been a few years now, he said, King is an immensely inadequate writer on a sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, book by book basis. By awarding the National Book Award to King, they recognize nothing but the commercial value of his books, which sell in the millions but do little more for humanity than keep the publishing world afloat. So that's pretty harsh, right? Um, and, you know, certainly after, you know, I've taken a look at, at Pet Cemetery and just you know, tore it apart as best I could. Uh, I have to say that, you know, I do take a bit of umbrage with, with uh, Mr. Bloom's opinion here. Uh, certainly when, uh, I think that the operative phrase here is, is little more for humanity than, than essentially from a, from, a, from a financial standpoint. Uh, I think that, as I said before, there, there's something to be said about King, uh, King's works. When I started this project, I was going to tackle all kinds of different King stories. I was going to make these great arguments, and it was just too big. It was too big. So, for the purposes of this project, I honed it down, because as I said before, I wanted to also make horror uh, a part of, of this project. Because he's got a bunch of great stories that, that aren't horror. You know, he's got Shawshank Redemption and The Body, which is the movie that became uh, Stand By Me. Uh, certainly, uh, The Green Mile. But I wanted to validate horror as well as, as try to validate Stephen King. So, for me the question became, can Pet Cemetery be viewed through a literary lens? Um, between Harold Bloom, uh, a gentleman named uh, Jonathan Culler, uh, he's, a, he's a professor at Cornell University, and other uh, you know, experts in, in the literary field, what I wanted to do was pick out a bunch of stuff in Pet Cemetery that like, hey, this looks literary. And literally, I thought I could put it up against a, kind of a rubric, right? And just match things up and go down the list and be like, hey, look, Stephen King's literary. And the fact of the matter is, is, is literary theory is nebulous and broad and wide, and there's a million different ways to approach it. So I had to generalize my approach while at the same time making sure that, I mean, for, you know, it, I love Stephen King, so I wanted to make sure I wasn't stacking the deck or anything. So, and, and there's a room full of readers here, I think that, that we can all like to agree on this stuff, is that a story worthy of study needs to express or communicate issues in dealing with facing the truths of real life. And to do that, uh, we need to come to an agreeable criteria upon which to build a compelling discussion. And for me, what I was looking for in the story was things like uh, complex prose style, atmosphere, social insight, spiritual meaning, uh, characterization and symbolism. And then for the purposes of today, because I got to put a pretty good clip, excuse me, uh, I'm going to go with uh, characterization and symbolism. I'm going to focus on that. Um, the thing with um, the thing with stories is, and, and certainly with characters, uh, when we get into things like characterization, um, we don't have to love the character in the book. We don't have to like them so much, but we need to relate to them on some level, right? I mean, we think about books like *A like Catcher in the Rye*, *Pull the Coffee*, or, or *The Great Gatsby*, or the books we studied in our literature class, uh, *Bigger Thomas* <coughs> from *Native Son* and *Amir* from *The Kite Runner*. You know, these are all people who aren't, you know, entirely likable, but at the same time, we see ourselves in these characters. Because they are flawed, just like we're flawed. I'm just going to cruise through my little overview here of the story itself. Um, is there anybody here who knows absolutely nothing about this story at all? Okay. So this, uh, the story focuses on a man named Lewis Creed. And the book starts on the first day that they arrive at their new home in Ludlow, Maine. Uh, Lewis Creed has just taken a new job. He is a doctor, so uh, the University of Maine has hired them, uh, hired him rather, to be their head physician at their on-campus medical facility. Uh, he has a wife named Rachel. He has a daughter, five years old, named Ellie, and a son named Gage Creed, who's not quite two years old yet. Um, in that opening scene, we also meet the Creed's new neighbor. <coughs> A kindly old gentleman with the down home accent named uh, Judd Crandall. And right off the bat, we also learn the danger of the road that they live by. There's a chemical factory right down 
uh, in town, and there's all kinds of 18 wheelers that are cruising back and forth on it. Judd tells them to make sure that they keep their cat church out of the street or it's going to get hit and killed. Uh, so the pet cemetery at the edge of the Creed property is a path. Ellie sees it the first day they get there. Judd says he will take them up there, and a few days later he does just that. They go up a long path, and at the end is the pet cemetery, which is just that. It's where the, the neighborhood kids, the, the Ludlow kids, have been burying their pets for, uh, I don't know, about 100 years or so. Uh, while they're up there, we are introduced to how Lewis Creed and Rachel Creed, his wife, uh, react to the idea of death. Uh, Lewis is, is very uh, straightforward, rational, pragmatic. Um, he sees death as a very natural part of life, uh, as natural, <coughs> as, natural as childbirth, whereas his wife, Rachel, uh, is made extremely uncomfortable, uh, not just by death, but by, by the spectacle of death. For instance, you know, seeing all the grave markers you know, for pets. And, and I'll get into why she is not okay with death in a minute here. But at the beginning, we're already seeing what becomes a main theme in this story is how we as humans react to death and dying, or in, in uh, many cases, how, how we kind of fail to, to react in one way or another. Uh, first real action happens on um, Lewis's first day uh, at the school when a young man, man named uh, Victor Pascal is brought in. He has just been hit by a car. He is in really bad shape, and Lewis can tell just by looking at him that there's nothing he can do for the kid. Uh, but he goes to work on him anyway, and the guy expires, and then he comes back and says some things to Lewis that this guy couldn't possibly know about Lewis. He warns him. <coughs> Later that night, when Lewis is sleeping, this, this kid Pascal comes and visits him. You can kind of look at Victor Pascal as, uh, as Jacob Marley to uh, Lewis Green's Scrooge. Uh, he, even though he looks all messed up and mangled, he's from, from the good, right, of capital G. We don't ever know really what that is, but we do know that he, uh, this, uh, this specter, if you will, is looking out for, for Lewis's uh, best intentions. He takes him up, uh, he, he takes Lewis up to the pet cemetery. There's a deadfall, a bunch of dead trees, branches, uh, at the edge of the cemetery. And Victor basically points in and says, look man, you're gonna be tempted to cross this thing, but don't ever do it. There's nothing waiting on the other side of this, but death to you and all the things you love. So, a little bit later, church dies. Judd Crandall, his neighbor, uh, feels compelled to take Lewis up to the Indian burying ground because Lewis saved Judd's wife, Norma. Um, and so they, he crosses the deadfall with Judd against you know, maybe his better judgment. They walk through the woods, they get up to the uh, Indian burying ground. Lewis buries church, and church comes back the next day. This is where we start to see some changes in Lewis, and I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, but he's starting to go from his uh, very, like, there's no such thing as the supernatural or the afterlife. Well, now he's got a dead cat that's come back to life. He has to re-question some of his core philosophies. Um, then, uh, unfortunately, the, the young son, Gage Tree, is killed in the road. He uh, gets away from his parents and, and runs out into the street just as a big old semi is coming along, and he is struck and killed. So at this point we're dealing with, even though it's a horror story, we're dealing with very real human trauma. Uh, you know, especially we're dealing with the death of a young child. Uh, overcome with his grief uh, and knowing of the power of the burying ground, Lewis decides to ship his family off to Chicago so that he can have some you know, privacy while he goes and digs up his dead son and takes him to the, <coughs> to the burying ground. But Cat Gage comes back. Gage isn't quite right because the burying ground has some very ancient powers that actually predate the, uh, the Indians who, who once had a presence in this area. Uh, Gage comes back, causes a bunch of trouble, he kills his mom, he kills Judd Crandall. Uh, Lewis, uh, for lack of a better phrase, uh, puts him down and ends up taking his wife up there and burying her. He thinks that's because he waited so long to bury Gage 
that that somehow spoiled him. So he rushes her up there, buries her, but she comes back, and it's the way that it's, the story ends is, is kind of ambiguous, but she comes back and it's pretty clear that, that she probably kills him. I've got my, my maths over here on, on the side, uh, which this, this alludes more to the, to the influence of the burying ground itself. I may come back to it if I have time. Um, so, characterization. So characterization is an author's use of description, dialogue, dialect, and action to create in the reader an emotional or intellectual reaction to a character, or to make the character more vivid and realistic. Careful readers note each character's attitude and thoughts, actions and reactions, as well as any language that reveals geographic, social, or cultural background. And Stephen King in, in uh, one of his nonfiction works pretty much sums it up way better. Right? He says the primary duty of literature is to tell us the truth about ourselves by telling us lies about people. <clears throat> so we're going to apply this to Lewis Creed. Lewis Creed is certainly a dynamic uh, character, which is a character that undergoes important internal changes in the course of the story, uh, changes in understanding, insight, commitment, and values. So these are all internal changes as opposed to external. Um, a little bit of symbolism here, I'll get more into symbolism in a minute, but certainly his last name, Creed, jumped out at me right off the bat, um, which is a system of beliefs, principles, or opinions. Uh, and like I said before, uh, with, with Lewis's whole philosophy in life, which he's very comfortable with, uh, completely changes over the course of the story as he is introduced to new information um, and, and comes under the influence of, of external sources as well as internal sources like guilt and remorse. Uh, so Lewis sees his life as a conflict between familial responsibilities and desires unfulfilled. Or, maybe more specifically, uh, consciously uh, he loves and wants to preserve his family, but unconsciously he rebels against their dependence on him, especially against the feeling that their needs restrain him from realizing something essential in himself. So let's talk a little bit about the duality of human nature. So these are uh, literature terms, the Apollonian and the Dionysian. So Apollonian is, is how Lewis Creed starts off the story. Uh, there's clarity and harmony, restraint, high-mindedness, mobility, intellect, and reason, and reason is highlighted. The Dionysian is pertaining to frenzy or undisciplined spontaneity, irrationality, sensuality, and emotion. And I have emotion highlighted. And then my, my cool little graphic here, I'm going to be torn between his heart and his mind, uh, being torn between reason and emotion. So throughout the story, we see this sort of emotional degradation of, of Lewis Creed as he, and not that there's really anything wrong with, with emotion per se, but in this instance, he is so uh, just rocked by, by the way he feels that, that it ultimately leads to, to his destruction. So right off the bat in the story, and we're talking about the very human side of the story right now too, I mean, we're taking the more out of the equation for right now. Uh, I want to be clear that Lewis loves his family, he wants to be there for them, he plans to be there for them, but at the same time he indulges in these fantasies um, and, and delusions where right when they're pulling up to the house is the opening few pages. Uh, they've just completed the trip from Chicago to, to Central Maine and he's pretty much had it being stuck in, stuck in the car with his family for that long, um, like, like many of us have, have probably been at some point in our lives. So he has this fantasy that, that continues to grow and build throughout the story, but at the beginning he's thinking, man, I just want to like ditch my family at a restaurant, throw the damn cat out of the car at the nearest off ramp, and hightail it down to Florida where he has this dream of, of becoming a paramedic at Disney World. <laughs> and just, you know, just live this totally anonymous life where no one can find him. So, We've talked about his approach to life, no belief in the supernatural or afterlife. But um, he, he kind of has this spiritual awakening when, when church comes back, and you know, rightly so. But during all of this, you know, he, he's kind of you know, reassessing his approach to life and the way he thinks of life. 
And he also comes to understand his, this fundamental aloneness that I think all of us feel at some point or other in life, but, but he really feels it. Like, I want to read you something. And this kind of gets a little bit into the complex prose style. There's some writing in this book that is, is not very good, just as far as style is concerned. But then he pulls out these gems every now and then. Um, and this, what I want to read you real quick, is after he's had an argument with his wife about how he talked to her, uh, their daughter about the issue of death. Um, so he's thinking about her and his relationship with his wife. So he more than half suspected that one of the things which had kept their marriage together when it seemed as if each year brought the news that two or three of their friends' marriages had, had collapsed was their respect of the mystery, the half-grasped but never spoken idea that maybe when you got right down to the place where the cheese binds, there was no such thing as marriage, no such thing as union, that each soul stood alone and ultimately defied rationality. That was the mystery. And no matter how well you thought you knew your partner, you occasionally ran into blank walls or fell into pits. And sometimes, rarely, thank God, you ran into a full-fledged pocket of alien strangeness, something like the queer air turbulence that can buffet an airliner for no reason at all, an attitude or belief which you had never suspected, one so peculiar, at least to you, that it, that it seemed nearly psychotic. And then you trod lightly. If you valued, you valued your marriage and your peace of mind, you try to remember that anger at such a discovery was the province of fools who really believed it was possible for one mind to know each other. Or know another. That's pretty deep. And keep, again, keep in mind, this is completely independent of any sort of supernatural stuff that's going on. This is just a guy <coughs> living his life and feeling his feelings. And then once, uh, you know, once, once Gage dies, it all just kind of falls apart. He rationalizes himself into this kind of flexible uh, morality, and then ultimately gives into temptation based on emotion. So, is is his naked emotion like leaves him open to to this manipulation from these outside influences, as well as to his own own grief and how he's unwilling to to deal with it, um, and it results. And you know, it just it just spirals into, into this madness to where he actually thinks that he can bury his dead son and bring him back to life, and that everything will be okay. Because not only do the things come back from this ground twisted and, and, and not good, but you have got to explain to your wife and to your daughter like, why their why their dead son and brother has, has suddenly reappeared, you know. But uh, I just wanted to read one more thing because I, I like it. Um, so this is him dropping into his madness. So, so it's probably wrong to believe that there can be any limit to the horror which the human mind can experience. On the contrary, it seems that some exponential effect begins to obtain as deeper and deeper darkness falls. As little as one, as, as little as one may like to admit it, human experience tends in a good many ways to support the idea that when the nightmare grows black enough, horror spawns horror. One coincidental evil begets, begets other, often more deliberate evils, until finally blackness seems to cover everything. And the most terrifying question of all may be just how much horror the human mind can stand and still maintain a wakeful, staring, unrelenting sanity. That such events have their own Rube Goldberg absurdity goes almost without saying. So do you guys get a sense of, you know, we're not just dealing with, uh, disposable horror character, that we're dealing with a, a real person who's going through some, some real issues. Uh, I think horror does a really good job of stepping outside of, of the lines of, of the reality that, that we all know. Uh, in, this, in this case, we're talking about nefarious supernatural elements. But at the same time, we're talking about the, the very real things that, that all of us are, are subjected to at some point or another. All right, so symbolism is my favorite part. Symbolism, the use of words, places, characters, or objects, which means something beyond what they are on a literal level. So the Creed House, in the story setting, it's interesting because you've got man's progress, right? You've got, you've got the house, you've got the town down the streets. You've got the road that runs through uh, modernity. But 
But at the same time, the Creed House is right on the edge of what is called the Indian wilderness in the book. And we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of square miles of protected state land that once belonged to the Mi'kmaq Indian tribe. So you, you get a taste of, of some of these classic American Gothic tropes <coughs> uh, as far as, as man versus the wilderness. But in this, it's, it's almost more of a man wanting to return to his wilderness because he feels that, that sort of repression from his, his wife's and his daughter's femininity. And I'll get into that in a minute. But it's interesting when you, when you juxtapose man's progress right up against a place where man has made no progress at all and is still full of mystery. I think that, that weather in, in just about any book you can draw some kind of symbolism out of. Uh, certainly in this, so I, I kept an eye on it as I was reading and I, I would mark every time I came across a point where the weather was mentioned. Uh, they moved to Maine in the summertime, so obviously the, the weather is, is fairly nice and it, and it holds out all the way to the night after Lewis has the dream of Pascal. And it, when he goes up to the cemetery by himself uh, to check things out and kind of rationalize the things that had happened the night before because he's not quite willing to believe that he had actually been visited by a ghost. So that night, it rains for the first time. Um, you know, it's, the, the rain is kind of symbolic of like the cold and dark things to come. And then the night where, where he digs up his son's body and takes it up to the, to the burying ground is the first time in the book any kind of wind is mentioned. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a windstorm. You know, I think things like winds of change or winds of fortune, you know, good or bad fortune. Uh, certainly in this case, things don't turn out too good for anybody involved. Um, Church the Cat, there I have all kinds of stuff on this. Because we're talking about when, when, they, when they show up in town and Judd tells, tells Lewis, you need to get the cat fixed so he doesn't go out and run around and go over the road and get killed. Lewis has, has been opposed to this idea of, of getting him fixed. Uh, it had come up before when they were still living in Chicago because he feels like, as I mentioned before, Lewis feels, at least inwardly, that, that he is being repressed and forced into this, into this world. Even though, by and large, he's completely accepted it and in many ways he's very happy with it, but he still feels that resentment toward the women in his family. And he feels the same way about fixing church, that he will take away that fundamental <coughs> feistiness, uh, the wildness of the cat, if you will, and, and essentially turn him into, into a domesticated house cat who doesn't go anywhere or do anything. He doesn't want to do that. Um, so Lewis is saddened, uh, you know, not only by the change in church, uh, but by the fact that when they do get him fixed, that the women seem to see no change in the cat at all, and to them, church is, is just kind of as, as he is supposed to be. He has is, is found his role in life. Uh, he's, he's been subjugated, in a sense. Um, and then Lewis, uh, you know, he does not like the fact that the women have had their way at the expense of something that is vital in both him and in the cat. And this is, I believe this is what compels him to go over the deadfall, to ignore the voices that are telling him. Because when he goes up there by himself, he actually kind of climbs up it and looks over into the woods beyond. And he kind of has this delusion where he thinks that maybe this path can return him to his masculinity. Uh, this path can, can take him to this kind of bachelor's paradise that he's created in his mind as far as you know, his whole Disney world thing. At the, uh, once Gage dies, though, the whole fantasy changes, and he's like, well, I'm just going to take Gage down to Disney World with me. <coughs> and we'll ride around and be paramedics together. Um, and then the path to the pet cemetery in the Indian woods. Now, before I switch this slide, I want you guys to be prepared to like really take in my, my artistic fortitude. Um, what, I, what I've prepared for you guys today is truly a work of art. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so here's my visual re uh, rendering of uh, the Creed House, uh, Judd's house across the street, and, and all of the important places that, that are in the book. I mean, 
you know, most of the book takes place here. There's a few scenes where, where they're not there, but by and large, it all takes place in either the house or the woods behind it. This is not to scale, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll notice I took uh, great care to make the path going from the edge of the creek property to the pet cemetery. It's nice. It's well kept. The neighborhood kids make sure that it's nice and mowed and, you know, kept clear of, you know, brambles and, you know, place where you can twist your foot. Um, all the way up to the pet cemetery, and and this is important because the path and then the cemetery at the end of the path are kind of analogous to our paths in life, right? We all follow our path. We might take a couple of missteps here and there, and then at the end we die. It's all very natural. The pet cemetery itself is a very natural thing, and it's a good place for kids to kind of, uh, you know get their first understanding of, of what losing something you love is all about. The deadfall itself is, is symbolic of the cusp of the unknown. It's, it's symbolic of, of the truths that Lewis comes to find in his own life, where beyond in, in the Indian woods is, is the other, capital O. It's the void, it's the abyss. Um, or, or if we're going to, you know, with, with the Indians and who used to be there, we could call it the spirit world. And uh, obviously, again, I took great care to make sure that that path didn't look quite as clear because it's difficult to get to the place where the dead come back to life. And even I think that the use of, of concentric circles <coughs> is interesting and that it implies a way to bridge the void between life and death. Let me try to this in here. Oh, one thing I liked was I was thinking about the, the Indian burying ground. When you go back to like the, the Gothic themes and ideas, is it's kind of like the haunted castle, right? It's it's this scary unknown place where where some crazy stuff is going on. And I, I'd love to if I if I would if I had more time I'd get more into the Indian stuff. So I apologize if Dr. Hunt is here. I wish I could have got into that. Um, so and I'm just going to read this real quick so I can wrap up. Uh, as far as this pertaining to real life, uh, the novel warns against engaging in hopeless struggles such as an attempt to reverse death. It suggests that the, that the best way for people to deal with death is to accept it, live and work through their grief and take time to heal. In its own way, Pet Cemetery suggests that those who refuse to accept death and struggle against it may only cause themselves greater losses. In Lewis's efforts to restore his family, he destroys, <coughs> he destroys their, the very thing he hopes to preserve. I'm going to look at this one last time before I <laughs> So, my conclusion is that as a genre, horror fiction is worthy of literary study. And I've come to that conclusion because Pet Cemetery is indeed a work of, of horror fiction. But, and I, and I hope I've presented it today well enough to, to make a compelling argument, and that we can reflect on this book. We can take a look at Lewis Creed. And I'd, I would love to talk about Rachel a little bit more, too, because there's such an interesting dynamic between and it makes sense. And the interplay in their relationship is so real. Um, King's legacy, as an author, I firmly believe that, you know, in another 50 or 100 years, that he'll be in the classroom. Um, it, it may or may not be Pet cemetery, And it may or may not be horror. I would love to think that that would be part of it. But I think that, that King has made enough of an impression on, on society, and the world of literature, that his name won't go away quietly into the night. The most important thing that I want to impart to you guys today, um, you know, whether you guys rush home to open up a, a work of horror literature, I would love it if you did that. But as, as readers, I want you guys to just think that the power of critical readership is in the hands of, of you guys, nobody else. Not me, not Jen. Not the teachers, even though my teachers have always been <coughs> wonderful. 
and probably all kinds of good stuff. Uh, certainly not Harold Bloom. Um, guys, you are the ones and the only ones that matter when it comes to finding the meanings in a, in a piece of literature that matter to you. And I really appreciate, appreciate you guys being here today, and that is all I have. Lovecraft and Stephen King share a sense of uh, cosmic horror in the age of relativity as interdimensional beings have ready access to the earth and they, they also share a certain sense of horror as mythology in, in the case of H.P. Uh, Lovecraft in uh, the encounter with the uh, unknown elder gods and in, in Stephen King with uh, the encounter with uh, the rather wonderful monsters of uh, the indigenous mythologies of North America and so my question is, uh, what contribution do you think Lovecraft and King make to the development of the more contemporary magic realist horror of uh, Neil Gaiman's American Gods or John H. V. Lindquist's uh, Let the Right One In? And <coughs> what shifts do you think uh, are posited by the latter works from Lovecraft and King? <laughs> so yeah, when we talk about 20th, 20th century horror literature, I mean the two biggest names are, are, are definitely King and Lovecraft. I think we can say that without much argument. Uh, there's certainly others in there who are up there. Um, I think that the way that Lovecraft opened the door, uh, both literally and perhaps, you know, maybe he, you know, he wanted to actually open the door to these other things. But, um, you know, he opened the door for, for other authors to jump on that. And certainly with Stephen King, um, when, in, in this book, in Pet Cemetery, when, when we talk about this, uh, and we get, I'll get into the Indian uh, indigenous mythologies here in a second, but King is saying that, sure, the, the Wendigo, this, this, this Native American uh, monster, if you will, uh, is said to have soured that ground. But the evil there is is implied to be timeless, essentially. That, it, that, it, that, the, that the land itself predates any kind of, of human contact with it. 
Uh, so, so I think to carry that forward, King is definitely talking about, and, and certainly if you read a book like It or the, the Dark Tower series, we're dealing with, with these entities that are very much like the great old ones, where we're, we're, we're not even a fly on the shoulder to these things. Um, and as far as like where it's going to go, and the, and the way that, that we use these, these different mythologies, uh, certainly, like, like I told you, I'm reading American Gods right now for the first time. It's excellent. And I, and I love that idea. I love that idea of, of taking these old ideas that aren't quite outdated, but are maybe kind of fading into obscurity. Like in, in the book, American Gods, there's a lot of, of deities that are mentioned that, that I have to get on old Google and, and look up. And it's awesome because it's like, man, you know, old Neil is, is taking these old things and, and he's making them new and breathing life into them. And another thing that I like about it is the more that I learn about these characters and uh, these, these gods that he's writing about, is he's staying true to what these gods were in their own mythologies, or, or as we refer to them now as mythologies, and that we're talking about back when they were actual gods. So I don't know, I mean, I think that the, the American public is really enjoying this, this kind of stuff. I mean, I think the American Gods is going to be a miniseries here in the next year or so. Uh, hopefully people will see it and then be compelled to pick up a book and, <coughs> and, and read it. Um, I think it's just going to keep rolling forward. I think people really enjoy this stuff. Um, all I would ask that is that in the course of my, my paper, I kind of put together the notion, you know, we talk about magical, magical realism as, as a genre. Um, when I was talking about Lovecraft, I wanted to find something a little more fancy sounding than weird fiction, which is what he was classified as and still is. Um, so I kind of put it together, he's kind of a speculative realist because he wants to use science to explain the things that happen. Where in the gothic stories, either the cause is supernatural, it's a ghost, it's, you know, something like that or it's explained away by something perfectly natural. He says, no, you're not going to undo the horror in my stories by saying it's completely natural, because it's not our natural. Um, and I, I think that that kind of it, you know, opened that doorway for people to play a little more in the genre without labeling themselves part of that genre. So you have people in magical realism who are generally better regarded than a horror fiction author. Um, and I think that it's just going to continue to kind of, it's going to put its little tentacles out into all these other genres. Because really, um, I saw a quote somewhere that said, horror is not a genre. Horror is an emotion. You can put horror into any kind of story. Um, it's something we feel, and it's how we react to things. And I think that, that King and Lovecraft kind of understood that and worked it in. And there are lots of authors who are going to continue that. I hope that answers. Questions. So. More short pre questions? <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you.